Well, before we get started tonight, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that most of us, not all of us, but most of us are joining tonight on the historic and contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and all Coast Salish people. At Mohai, we acknowledge the forced displacement of Native communities from this land while honoring the endurance of the Duwamish people who still live here. To this day, the Duwamish people have yet to receive federal recognition. And if you are local, we encourage you to visit the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center in West Seattle, or you can check out their website and learn more. If you're joining us from outside of Seattle, we encourage you to learn about the indigenous communities in your area. I also wanna note that this program is taking place during a year of unprecedented protests against the police violence towards Black people. These protests in our community and across the nation have been a call to action for each of us to state unequivocally that Black Lives Matter. And Mohai stands unfalteringly with those who are calling for justice now. So now, I am delighted to introduce you to our speaker tonight, Mohai's very own curator of collections, Clara Berg. Hi, Clara. Hi. <laughs> Clara curated 2019's exhibit, Seattle Style Fashion Function, which some of you got to see here at Mohai. And she manages a collection here of roughly 100,000 3D artifacts. Clara received her MA in Costume and Textile Studies at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. Clara, take it away. Thank you, Nicole. Well, welcome to this uh, second behind the scenes that is digital, but uh, as Nicole mentioned, this is a program that we've been doing since 2015. Uh, again, for our uh, low and no vision attendees or anyone who's calling on the phone, I'm a white woman in my 30s with short blonde hair, and I'm also going to use this opportunity to plug my earrings that I bought from the Mohai Mercantile, which is now online, so you too can buy fun things from our Mercantile, even though Mohai is closed. So for those of you who haven't attended a behind the scenes program in person, to give you a sense of what it's like, uh, we use uh, the conference rooms at Mohai. I put out a table with muslin on it and it's room for about 30 people to see garments from the collection. Uh, some just on hangers, but also what's inside of them, how they're put together. Um, an opportunity because the things are usually in storage that getting to see things, but also even if they were on display, you wouldn't get to see the insides. You wouldn't get to find out how this seam meets that seam. And we've asked attendees to this program often what other topics they'd be interested in because we have lots of things in the collection we have lots of things I'd love to get out and we've had the request multiple times for accessories shoes hats other kinds of accessories and I've been resistant to do a shoe program because I'm even though our shoes are fabulous even in this small format in person they're still small objects and it can be hard to I'm not sure that people would have the right experience in person getting close to shoes when it's you know, there's two rows of people. So when we knew we were going to have to still be in COVID times and do another online behind the scenes, I thought this is the perfect opportunity to, to highlight the accessories in our collection. So uh, and shoes particularly, we have a lot of recently taken higher res images because we've been working for the last few years on an initiative to photograph more of our collection, have better photographs, have them online, so at the end of the program, you'll get a link to seeing some of these images online. So a lot of these are available, um, but you'll get even closer today than we have on our online images. Uh, as Nicole mentioned, we all take questions periodically through the program. I have sort of groupings of shoes. So it'll be about every two or three pairs of shoes I'll pause. Um, and these programs, I it's weird to do this over Zoom because I, I don't want to just be the one talking and, and unfortunately I won't, won't get to hear your voices, but I, I don't know everything um, and I'm not, I don't have a particular expertise in shoes. So there may be people on this call that know more than me and have interesting insights or be able to answer questions that other people have. I want to hear from you. So please ask questions or if you, if I say something, you are able to fill in further information or a term or in something uh, please, please share. I wish, wish it wasn't just me talking tonight. So to get started, I often will save 
my favorite things for the end of the program. Uh, it was hard to pick a favorite, but this first pair of shoes, actually, I'm going to start with a pair of shoes that for some reason has always been the one that I have identified as my favorite pair of shoes in the collection. So this is a pair of uh, leather shoes that have a bronze-like finish. Uh, they're almost purple in person. They're, they have about a one and a half inch heel and a pointed toe. And this kind of heel is known as a Louis heel, sometimes called a Louis XIV or a Louis XV heel. So a reference to um, the 18th century monarchs of France. So a Louis heel is defined as one that has this concave curve in the back of it, and then also the heel flares out slightly at the bottom. Another good term to know for uh, this talk is vamp, which is the name for sort of the top, the, the upper part of the shoe that's kind of over the, over the toes and above the toes. So in, on this pair of shoes, the vamp is where the beating is. So when you hear me referring to the vamp of the shoe, it's kind of that top front part of the shoe. So these shoes have, as you can see, four straps that are going, that are how you open the shoe and they are kind of tapered so that they're narrow in the center so that there's open work between them. And then below the straps, that pattern is kind of continued. So there's, it's open in the front with these gold beads and I think what I really like about these shoes is for one thing, they're from the 1910s, which I think is a period in fashion history that's often overlooked, but has a lot of really cool fashion in it. And then also that these are very elegant shoes. They would be nice for evening wear. But with that, the, the nice thing about the Louis heels is that they're pretty, they're, these would be pretty comfortable. They're definitely not my size, but if they were my size, I think I could walk around for a while in these shoes. They're, they've got a heel, but a nice sturdy heel. Um, so I've always gravitated towards this pair of shoes. This is another pair that has kind of uh, some similar elements, although this is from the 1920s. These shoes have suede on the toes and the back of the heel and then across the vamp and where there is lacing is this brown kind of plain brown leather that has cutwork design so that it's open. So you would see the stockings that the person is wearing with these shoes through through the cutwork. So you could also imagine, um, you know, depending on what kind of stockings you wear, then that's the color that's coming through in in the pair. And one thing that I really like about these shoes is because they are very similar to a pair that we have a photo of uh, Bertha Knight Landis wearing, our first mayor, our first female mayor. And one of the first female mayors to, to be in charge of a major US city. She was mayor in the 1920s. And this is a pair of shoes. So if you can see, this is a, there's a black and white photo of her sitting at her desk. And then I'm zooming in on the shoes and they're a little more practical than the ones that we have in the collection. The heel's a little lower and thicker. And whereas the ones that I'm showing have, have a contrast of suede, two different kinds of leather, leather suede and kind of a plainer leather, hers are plainer all over but they have a similar cutwork pattern. Um, she's wearing kind of more plain colored hose. So it's just the contrast of the, the color of the stockings and the shoes. But I also really like that you can see that there's scuffs on the heels and there's scuffs on the toes. So this is not, these are, you can picture that she was walking around in these shoes. She was using these shoes. This is not a staged photo where she put on some fancy pair of shoes. These are her everyday shoes. Um, and they have a little style to them, which I really like. So I'm gonna pause and see if there are any questions already about that first two pair of shoes that I've brought up. All right, this is Nicole. So Claire, there's a couple of questions. Uh, one, have shoe sizes gotten larger over time? Generally, my understanding is yes. Um, I have, so with clothing in museums, there's this uh, sense that there's a survival bias that smaller things have just have survived in collections, whereas because smaller, um, because larger things can always be cut down and smaller things are harder to expand. So it's something that things that no one can fit into that stay in good condition. So I think with shoes, museum collections often have really small shoes. And I think there's a little bit of that survival bias going on because um, you know, some of these shoes, if they were in bigger sizes and they're in a vintage store, people can buy them, people that can wear them, but ones that are too small for other people to wear, they stay in good condition, they get donated to museums. There's definitely um, though, 
their narrower sizes were more common in the past. Um, we have a lot of shoes that are like quadruple A, triple A. Uh, and today I think average, most people have width B shoes. My, what I've heard about that, but I'd be interested to see if other people have other, have heard other things is that shoes are a little bit like, it's kind of like spending your life in a corset that if you are always wearing tight fitting shoes, your feet will kind of stay narrower. And that if you wear, we're, we're used to more like we have athletic shoes, we have a comfort is really important in our footwear and that human feet just sort of do spread if they are always in kind of wider shoes. I don't know if that, that's what I've heard. Maybe that's a myth. Um, we definitely have a lot of very narrow shoes in the collection. Do you know what size these shoes are that Ooh. we're looking at? <laughs> um, I don't. Um, okay. I, I wish it's funny because I, I did take a look at all of these shoes in person before I did this program, but I was like, I wish I had, I, I think they don't have standard sizes, but I wish I had measured all the heels. So I'm talking some about like how high the heels are, but I am kind of guessing because I didn't measure them all before I did mm -hmm. the program. So I think most of them, well, I have pretty big feet. Um, none of them would fit me. I have, I wear a size <laughs> nine and a half. So let's just say none of the shoes you're going to see are going to fit me. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, there was a question about that first pair of shoes, the one that you've always loved. Uh, are they women's shoes? Yes. Um, these, these would have been designed for women. Um, we have, we have some, we, there are a couple men's shoes in this program, but uh, most of the ones you'll see tonight are women's shoes. But really that that's historically women's and, and men's, but uh, you know, if they're in your size, wear whatever you want. <laughs> and there's some questions about Terrell's. Oh yes. Where is uh, Terrell's located? Oh, where is it located? Uh, gosh, I should have written that down. Um, most of these stores were, there's, there's a bunch of shoe stores that will be named tonight. Um, they were all downtown as far as I know. Um, Terrell's, a bunch of these pairs of shoes are from Terrell's and it was clearly a very, a pretty big well-known store in its time in the early 20th century. Um, I, I, sorry, I, I didn't write down where the cross streets are of these stores, which I will say also, if anyone who has a, my half of the work that I do is I go on to Seattle Public Library website and look at the historic Seattle Times and now Seattle PI is also available online. So if you have a Seattle Public Library card and you like doing this kind of research, you can search by word the whole history of the Seattle Times. Well, not, it goes partially into the 19th century, but not all the way into the 19th century and now the PI. So uh, if you're interested in Terrell's, there are ads, there's articles. Uh, I recommend uh, get, getting your library card out and searching for those because there's it's just a wealth of information. That's a great tip. Okay, we have a couple of questions uh, about the cost of the shoes. So how much did shoes cost and typically how many pairs of shoes did women own? That's, that's a great question. I, my understanding is that it's similar to um, that, that clothing and accessories in general were more expensive in proportion to income than they are now. And also that people in general didn't have as many pairs, didn't have as many pairs of shoes and as many garments. So in terms of cost, I don't know exactly, but I would guess, I mean, especially there, I mean, the beating on all these, in today's dollars, I feel like a pair of shoe of this pair of shoes would probably be between 100 and maybe $500. I mean, people did spend a lot more money on clothing, but then they didn't buy as many pieces. And I think, you know, also looking at, you know, Mayor Bertha that, she's got scuffs on her shoes. She's wearing them every day. She doesn't, she's not buying a new pair every week. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know exactly that. That's a, that's a great question for um, if you, that looking at those historic ads, they'll have prices of shoes. Of course, they'll be in, you know, historically. So maybe these were like $10 in 1912, but that would translate to quite a bit more now. Sure. Oh, well, there is some interest in a current model or brand that is similar to this style of shoe, if you know of one. Oh, um, I don't think they sell them anymore, but American Duchess is a company that makes historic style shoes for historical reenactors. And I think they don't sell them anymore. I should have bought them when I saw them, but they had a pair of, um, of Edwardian shoes that had a very similar beading pattern to this that went down the front. Um, so American Duchess sells everything from 18th century to kind of early 20th century. And it, it 
their stock kind of changes by what they can sell, but that's, if you want really historic looking shoes, that's a great place to go. To go. All right, now looking at these shoes in the picture, there's a lot of buttons. Uh, so one person's wondering, did women still use button hooks to button their shoes? Yes, I, this is in the 19 teens, uh, there was definitely, we have a lot of, the, the shoes that we have with all the buttons are like right around the turn of the century. So the button hook would not have been out yet by this time. So I think I think women's, it was maybe kind of on its way out, but I think most women would still have had a button hook at home for, for these kind of shoes. All right, let's pause there and we'll pick up more questions right. in a little bit. So the next group of things that I wanted to talk about um, are focusing in on some very specific little details on pairs of shoes. So this is a pair of silver pumps. Uh, and if you don't know, pumps, um, the official definition is that they usually that they have heels and then they have a low vamp. So the previous shoes we were looking at had decoration that was kind of going up almost to the to the um, to the ankle, but pumps tend to be a lot kind of lower lower cut. So this is a pair of silver pumps from the 1920s. One thing that is uh, is common for evening shoes in the 1920s is that, they, is that they had straps because dancing in the 20s was did involve kicking up your heels a little bit. You didn't want your lovely shoe to go flying. So this strap is kind of has the key detail. Um, as you can see, was, is, gold, is gold and silver together. Uh, it actually fastens on the, whatever the outside side of the shoes are, but on the inside, it has kind of this trompe l'oeil type. It looks sort of like a buckle that there's the gold, um, the gold leather is kind of going under a piece of the silver leather to kind of attach there, but it's not, you can't remove it. It's all stitched down. And then across the top of the strap, there's pieces of gold and silver leather that are kind of woven in between one another. And this could only have been done by handwork. I don't know how else you would do this. And then they're backed with a softer white leather so that it's smooth but on, on the back of that. So it's not all these little pieces sticking in. These are from Frederick and Nelson, which um, longtime Seattleites know that was a beloved department store. It was founded in the 1890s and it closed in 1992, known for um, having very high-end fashions, especially in the 20s. It would be importing some really high-end things. And these, the markings on these say that they were made in Switzerland for Frederick and Nelson. So here's another pair of 1920s shoes. There's so many great little details on our 20s shoes. So this is a pair of light pink evening shoes. The fabric is a silk fi, which is, um, if, if you look really close, it looks like there's kind of long ridges in the silk. They have a higher heel and these are d'Orsay cuts. And I think that definition is gonna go into the chat too. Um, also my French is terrible. So even you'd be like, what, what did she even say? So d'Orsay shoes are ones that um, the sides are cut away between the toe box and the heel. So you can see the instep. So that there's this open space between sort of the front and back of the shoe. Um, it, it's still a d'Orsay if it's just one side. So sometimes shoes are just cut on one side but these are cut on both sides. But the real kind of highlight of these shoes is this little detail that's right at the front of the toe box and then also on the outside sides of both pairs of shoes, both, both shoes, which is these little pieces of silver leather with stitching on them that come together with this little silver and pink button. Uh, it is a faux button, you can't un undo this, but it is such a lovely little kind of art deco detail. And I think that's also why it's so fun to look at shoes because that's a detail, I mean, you could see it from far away, but it's really only the owner of the shoes when they're purchasing them or having them in her closet and putting them on that she would see this little tiny detail. And it's, you know, it, from far away, it still creates this lovely effect on the shoe, but it is, um, it's, it, these are little, little sculptures, little works of art. So I'm gonna move forward in time a little bit for a fun uh, detail on this pair of shoes. So this is a pair of brown pointed toe pumps with a spike heel. I think it's not quite narrow enough to call it a stiletto heel, but narrower heels really became in fashion in the later 50s and into the early 60s. And overall, this would be a kind of plain pair of brown pumps were it not for this black sort of harness situation that is on the front of the toe and then um, kind of 
comes around the sides and then has this very low strap over the front. Um, it's a little bit bondagey, I feel like, if, if that's okay to say that um, it's this sort of surprising detail. I haven't seen this on a lot of shoes. Uh, one funny thing about this pair, this and this photo particularly, um, I almost photoshopped it out and then I said, no, 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 I'm gonna keep it. But there's this weird, something's poking out from the bottom of the shoe, if you see down here. Um, that is masking tape that's on the bottom of these shoes. So these were worn for the fashion show at the Century 21 World's Fair. So the World's Fair that was in Seattle in 1962. The fashion show was sponsored by Vogue. It was called The Miracle of American Fashion. And it was showcasing the kinds of things that the, the middle-class fairgoer could afford. Uh, so it was a lot of day wear and sporty clothes and kind of nicer clothes, but not like evening gowns. And so part of the reason that this has uh, masking tape on the bottom is that these would were never worn outside. They were only brand new, handed to models who had to walk down a runway. And shoes sometimes are really slick on the bottom. And so they were putting tape on the bottom of the shoes. And also because the runway was over a fountain. So if you slipped and fell, you were going into the water. Mohai was given so that the show at the, at the fair changed every month. So if you went back to the fair, you could see a new show at the Fashion Pavilion. So the last show that was ran from the end of September to the beginning of October when the fair closed, the whole, all the clothes and the accessories from that show were donated to Mohai afterwards. So these shoes, we actually know what these shoes were worn with. This is on the right is this black wool dress with brown details. In the, the description from the, the script of the fashion show, this is called, the brown color is called cognac. So this is a black dress with cognac trim and then a black, a uh, velvet roll a hat with this rolled brim. So this is the, someday I'd love to do an, um, a display where we put all of these pieces back together and kind of put the fashion show together. So this is, this is what the complete look that these shoes would have gone with. So I'm gonna pause again after those three pairs and see if there's any further questions. Yes, we do have more questions. Now those beautiful silk shoes they look like they would be uh, difficult to keep clean. And then we saw the bit of scuffing on Mayor Landis's shoes earlier. So how do people like Mayor Landis or the person who wore these shoes um, keep them from getting dirty on like rain soaked sidewalks or streets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Seattle, there's, there's a few pairs we'll see tonight that doesn't seem like would be, you'd have to pick your Seattle days to wear them. Well, with um, Mayor Landis's shoes, those appear to just be regular leather shoes. So those would um, shoe polish and shining, you know, you could take those to a, you could do it yourself or you could take it to a regular shoe shine and get them, you know, leather works pretty well with kind of looking like new, maybe not in a torrential downpour, but as far as scuffs, there's some easy things to do with that. These shoes, um, I mean, I think it's similar to how you would, with a pink silk dress, uh, you would, try to wear it in not in puddles. If you're getting, if it gets dirty, you would try to spot clean it. But at some point, um, you know, these are not everyday shoes. These are, these are very susceptible to getting dirty. So the, these do have a few um, scuffs and scratches on them. We, we can tell that they're worn, but uh, I don't know that there's a lot you can do with pale pink shoes. I think you just have to be really careful. They are beautiful. <laughs> So one question is, where do you get the shoes? Thrift shops, donations, collections? In, in the Mohai collection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so most of our things come in through donations and we've been collecting since the 1950s. Um, well, the Seattle Historical Society did collect some things before that. So we have an online form on our website that has a bunch of questions about what the item is and how you acquired it and what the story is. In general, our, what we're most interested in is things with a good Seattle story. It doesn't mean, and good doesn't mean a famous person, but um, you know, if, if, if they're beautiful shoes, but you know, they're from your aunt who lived in Minnesota, they're, you know, that's not as, as relevant. Or even if it's just like, oh, I don't know, I, I, I found them somewhere, do you like these? But something that's like you know, where you wore them or, you know, something about the person that wore them is more interesting to us. But yeah, we, we depend mostly on donations for acquisitions uh, to the collection. All right, thank you. So Clara, when did ready to wear shoes take over custom shoes? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, my, I think that would be more in the 19th century sort of industrial revolution era. Um, at the big, so oof, I don't know exact date, but pretty much as long as Seattle has been around, which Seattle was founded in the 1850s, uh, you, these would have all been um, factory made shoes as opposed to um, custom made by a, a cobbler who I almost I almost that word almost escaped me but uh yeah so that's actually one um kind of a uh random thing i mentioned that company american duchess so that's not a seattle company but um i i went to a talk from them and talking about how they can't make shoes exactly authentically um from like the 18th century because like you can't they didn't have shanks in them they didn't have any kind of support they a lot of the 18th century shoes were straight um and that we just like no one would put, I think you actually, maybe you can't even, you're not even like allowed to make shoes that don't have certain kinds of structures in them anymore. So there are kind of, I think there was a modernization of shoe making that really happened with the industrial revolution in the 19th century. Well, related to that, when did women's shoes start using buckle closures? Ooh, I do not know. I'd be interested to see if anyone else uh, on the chat knows, but I don't know that. And we do have someone who posted uh, in the chat that Terrell's shoe company was at 903 Second Avenue. Awesome. This is somebody this found is it. Fantastic. <laughs> and that's all for now. Great. All right. We'll keep going. Oh, I'm really excited about this next section. I mean, I'm excited about everything. Uh, so the next theme that I wanted to go with was historicism in, in footwear. So um, shoes that are specifically referencing earlier historical eras. So the first pair is, this is a pair from 1915. This is a pair of pumps in a brown and black brocade fabric with a tall, I'm gonna call it a tongue. I think usually the tongue of a shoe goes underneath the lacing, but um, there's no lacing, but I, what, this, this appears to be a tongue. It's a very decorative tongue of the shoe. Um, and I chose to talk about these because these are very 18th century in their in their references. It's a their 20th century shoe. They're from Schwartz Footwear in Seattle, but uh, they have this, they have that Louis heel that I mentioned earlier and this overall fabric look. So here's some examples. So we don't have any 18th century shoes in our collection, but the open access part of the Met collection does. So here's two pairs of shoes from the from the Mets collection that are actually from the 18th century. The upper pair is from earlier in that in that time, and the lower pair is from kind of the middle part of that century. And you can see some of the similarities. So they've got the these are Louis heels from from the time of the Louis, uh, a little shorter, a little uh, thicker, but having that curve in the back and that flare at the bottom. They're also fabric shoes so that the surface, especially the upper pair, that there's the surface is fabric and then also they used fabric to cover the, the, the back of the heel that would be probably wood or another kind of solid material. And then both of the 18th century shoes have like straps or something that kind of folds over the front in front of the tongue, but they do have the tongue of the shoe kind of sticking up decoratively. And one interesting thing about the 18th century shoes is that I'm actually not sure whether those want either of those um, are men's or women's shoes. The ones that we have in our collection would have been intended for women, but in the 18th century, it was actually it was men first who were wearing the high heel shoes, um, and you know that there that's why they were Louis the Louis the 14th was the one who kind of pioneered um, higher heels in for Western fashion. Uh, so both of these pairs of the shoes um, might be men's shoes and they might be women's shoes because heels were definitely worn by both genders. So here's our first um, kind of official pair of menswear shoes. Uh, if you've gone to a program of mine before, you've definitely heard me talk about John Doyle Bishop. He was a, a retailer in Seattle who sold women's wear, but he was also known for his kind of big personality and he had a very um, fun eclectic wardrobe and he donated a bunch of things to the Mohai collection. So this is a pair of carpet slippers is how they're described. So we were talking in the, um, in the initially in the chat that people were wearing a lot of slippers this, this past year. So these have kind of a slipper shape, but uh, they do have a leather sole and kind of a hard heel. So I think these actually could be worn outside, not in the rain, I would probably not recommend. Um, and these, the fabric is a woven fabric that is kind of uh, sort of nubby and it has 
a floral pattern over a white background, but they're kind of, it's sort of made to look like it might be a cross stitch or maybe a hand done fabric uh, because they are referencing um, an, an 18 or a 19th century style. So, well, first I want to show you, this is, this is John Doyle Bishop. Uh, and he, so menswear since the 19th century, there has been a trend in menswear to be kind of darker colors, more sober, this idea that, oh, the, the color and the pattern, that's for women, you know, men wear plainer things, men aren't into, into fashion as much. Uh, of course, that is a huge generalization, but in the 1960s and early 70s, there was this moment in menswear that fashion historians refer to as the peacock revolution, which is where there's this explosion of color and pattern in menswear. And John Doe Bishop was definitely one of those people who embraced that. And so these shoes are from Saks Fifth Avenue. He would have bought them on a buying trip in New York, but then probably worn them in Seattle. And they are, a lot of the peacock revolution styles were referencing earlier eras, things that were more patterned and exciting for menswear. And so in the 19th century, you know, on the street, going to evening wear, evening events, or going to business things, you know, menswear was like black suits, dark colored suits, but at home, men wore sometimes very colorful and interesting smoking jackets and uh, evening caps and uh, shoes ca sho uh, like this. And so these, these um, getting some weird pop-ups on my computer, closing that, okay. Uh, <laughs> these, uh, these slippers were often would be, uh, the women in their lives would do the embroidery work of these so that the women's magazines at the time had all kinds of instructions of patterns and things to do different kinds of embroidery or cross stitch. So the upper pair is a pair, um, a pair of black embroidered shoes in our collection. And the lower pair, um, it's a cross, it's the, it's an, a cross stitch pattern, but um, these are a little sturdier. They have a bit of a heel to them. So that's what these shoes are referencing. But like I said, you probably wouldn't wear them on a rainy day. He might've, if I was him, I'd probably wear them, you know, in his shop that has a carpet. It's not exactly outside, but it is still public as opposed to the 19th century version of these. It was really for just at home kind of private wear uh, versus of being, you know, in his store and being John Doyle Bishop. All right, I'm going to pause again for uh, questions. Okay, great. We actually have one that was left over uh, referencing something you said previously about the development of structure in shoes. And so the question is, when did we go to specifically right and left shoes? Ooh, um, my understanding is also that, that happened in the 19th century. Um, I don't know if it was directly related to sort of the industrialization of, of shoe design, but um, so if you don't know, so shoes used to be straight. And so they would both be the same. And the idea is that you sort of broke them in and they would kind of mold to your foot over time. Uh, but then, I mean, that seems, it's like, that's a lot of commitment to your shoes. I mean, that just takes time to kind of, to break them in. So I don't, I don't know actually exactly when, when that happened, but I, I would, Certainly, I mean, it was in full effect by the 20th century. So I think that that happened in the 19th century, probably midway through would be my guess. But now, I'm, I feel like I'm you. I'm being stumped tonight. <laughs> well, we have uh, we have a viewer who has some facts to share. Um, Great. Uh, one of them actually to that question: right and left shoes were developed in the 1850s. Great. Uh, and then also to the earlier question that buckles were used as early as the 18th century. So we thank, have, we have someone you. helping in the, in the audience yeah. tonight. Um, we do have some other questions for you. In what US cities or regions were shoes manufactured or what foreign countries? So that's a great question. So in general, I don't think any of these shoes were made in Seattle. It was kind of a specialty item and that um, nationally there was, you know, that place different areas would have different specialties. I don't know a lot about the, the national industry, but I do know that several of the pairs of sort of the, some of the shoes you'll see tonight were made in Philadelphia. Uh, Laird Showburn Company made that first pair of shoes. There's another pair, we've either, I, there's another one in here that was a Philadelphia. Oh, I think the, I think it's coming up. So that definitely was one place where there was some really fabulous shoes coming out of, but I don't know 
I don't know where else. It may have been more of an East Coast thing, although it probably also depended. I mean, we're looking mostly tonight at kind of fancier evening and fancy daytime shoes. Um, there may have been, you know, like boots were coming from different areas, uh, different, we, well, I guess actually we did have some boot manufacturers in Seattle. Um, so it kind of depends on the purpose of the shoe and the, the specialties that the places would have. But um, definitely, I mean, in Europe, there would also have been shoe manufacturers. I know that England had a fair number. Um, I think most countries would have probably had their own in the early 20th century, I mean, every company had to have at least one shoe manufacturer. There's some comments uh, about how there was a lot of shoe manufacturing in the Northeast. So to your point. Okay, somebody had a question about the World's Fair shoes. Uh, hmm. Had a town and country label inside of them. They're wondering, did that town and country label also make the clothes? And was that related to the magazine of the same name? I don't know if it was related to the magazine. Um, I think I think all of the pairs of shoes, I think Town & Country supplied all the shoes for that runway show. I think all the ones we have are from Town & Country, but that was just, as far as I understand, a shoe manufacturer. Um, the dress, I don't think we have a maker for the, the hat. The dress was Nellie Dawn, uh, which was a US manufacturer. So the the garments were from all over the country. And we have at least one that was made in Seattle. It's from Sailmates, and which was a, a local company. Foster Hochberg was the over brand and then Sailmates was one of their divisions. So I think they tried to get garments from major manufacturers all over the country. Uh, so the, the town and country was the shoes specifically, but they did not make the garments as well. That makes sense. All right, that's it for now. Great, okay. All right, so now I'm moving on to surface decoration. There we go. Uh, so what what Seattle shoe program would it be if we didn't at least have one pair of Nordstrom shoes? Nordstrom, of course, founded in 1901 and until the 1960s when they acquired Best Apparel was a shoe only business. So these are from the 1950s. So this is from Nordstrom's shoe only era. And if you've ever been confused about if, if it's Nordstrom or Nordstrom's, they have changed at different times. They have branded themselves with just Nordstrom and branded themselves as apostrophe S. So these ones are marked Nordstrom's apostrophe S. So these are Nordstrom shoes. They are uh, pointed toe pumps with a spike heel. And they have this fabulous multicolored surface decoration that's kind of like confetti or it looks sort of like watercolor paints and these oranges and yellows and greens. And it has this shiny patent leather surface. So the, the brand for these is uh, Deliso Debs by Palter Deliso. This is a New York based company. Uh, the designer was Palter Deliso. And uh, the, the Debs is a reference to debutante, which was a commonly used term for meaning that this is for like older teenagers and young women, that this is the kind of the cool hip line of, uh, of, his, of his product, which I'm now out of the Debs demographic and I would definitely still wear these. I guess they're, I guess they're, they're a little bit more fun and youthful than maybe some of the other designs, but I feel like any, any age could wear these shoes. Another pair of, of men's shoes, so this is a pair of flat Oxfords made of different color leathers. So there's this kind of shiny blue leather on the back of the heel, red through the kind of the main body, purple around where the laces are, and then brown on the toes. But the real exciting thing about these shoes is what's on the toes. So these are worn by Seattle Times photographer, Phil Weber, who was known for his fun shoes. Uh, these kind of, they're, they kind of are like bowling shoe vibe or something in a, in a cool way. And I don't know if he did the illustration or if he had a friend do them, but this is a hand painted design. Uh, it is showing his houseboat before and after it was renovated. I, based on the pictures, I'm pretty sure that the right shoe, which is on our left is before, cause it looks like a smaller building. Um, and then the, the, I guess he painted it purple. This house on the right um, is, is, is the renovation. Uh, but a really fun like shoes as kind of this personal piece of expression. I think these are just so fun. 
And then of course, these are the shoes that were on all of the marketing material for this. Um, one of the more contemporary pairs of shoes that we have in the collection. These are some very tall platform pumps, probably I, definitely the tallest we have in the collection. They're probably, I, I think I actually saw that uh, the, the one of the founders of Hourglass Footwear is on the call. So she maybe knows exactly how tall these heels are. Uh, but they're tall because they have a, this, this thick um, platform that's probably more than an inch. So uh, it's, these, these are quite the towering pair of shoes. They are painted then in this shimmery purple color, slightly different purple on the heel than on the main body of the shoe, and then have these painted violets on the toe and on the back of the heel. So this is a local company called Hourglass Footwear, and it was founded by a group of um, Art, women artists in Seattle who were looking for a way to um, have another outlet for selling their art and something that was maybe more sustainable, something more consistent. Um, and so these are hand-painted shoes. They have a bunch of, of official designs that you can pick from, but then you can also um, have them, you know, do something that reflects your own style. And they show, I, I think they use this shoe design to show off a lot of their um, illustrations because there's so much more real estate with this gigantic tall shoe and that you can use that piece of the platform for additional space to do the decoration. But you can, they have, you can get the same design in shorter shoes or flats or clogs. Um, and so these actually, we wanted to acquire these some from Hourglass shoes for the collection. And we did a little contest where people could vote on, um, there were several different designs, which ones they liked best that they wanted to go into the Mohai collection. And so this was the pair that won. The artist is Rachel J.E. Sprague. And the design, your turning violet, violet is a reference to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. All right, I'm going to pause again. Okay. Well, that name is really fun. You're turning violet, violet. Um, and those shoes are just gorgeous. One person is wondering, how do you get to make and name the shoe after oneself? Wait, uh, how, I, how does the person get to make and name a shoe after oneself? So this isn't actually named after someone named Violet. Oh, yes, yeah. So it's in, um, yeah, from in Charlie and Chocolate Factory that Violet chews the gum and turns and turns, turns violet. <laughs> and are these custom ordered? Yes. These shoes? They, well, I think they have some in stock. So um, that I, I haven't visited their website today, but they have, they usually have certain pairs that are in stock that have already been painted. And if they're in your style, you can buy them. But uh, a lot of their business is in custom of saying, you know, I'd like this size, I'd like this pattern. Um, or, you know, I'd like to invent a new pattern. Um, one thing they do a lot of is shoes for weddings so that um, you can get the same pattern on a pair of heels. And then when you're like at the end of the night, ready to switch to flats, you can still have decorative shoes that have the same pattern, but flatter. That's fun. Oh, and uh, we do have a comment in the chat that these are 5.5 .5 inch heels. So now <laughs> we know how tall they are. I believe um, it. <laughs> they do look like they would be fun to actually walk in though too. Um, one person wants to know how much do the violet heels cost? Ooh, um, I, I bet that the that Lisa could chime in. Um, I they're they're over a hundred dollars, but I think they're not more than two hundred. Which for hand painted shoes is like pretty good deal. Um, I, yeah, I haven't checked on their website lately, but Hourglass Footwear, they're online. <laughs> oh, um, there's a comment in the chat, $200. Okay. And someone posted the website, so y'all can go check it out. <laughs> Are the... Asking those questions and answering them. <laughs> right. <laughs> got, a, got a hustle. It's an amazing system here. <laughs> um, are the Weber shoes made by the shoemaker that used to be in the Pike Place market? Ooh, um, I... They do feel like they um, could be made in Seattle because they have a very kind of like crafted um, kind of look to them. I don't know. We don't have the name of the maker for these shoes, but I would believe that. Yeah, the colors on that are just amazing. All right, we're ready for more shoes, Clara. Okay. All right, so now I'm focusing on embellishments. 
So we have, th these are not as tall as the last. We have another pair of platform shoes. So this is a 1940s pair of, of platforms. And when we think in the 20th century of of platform shoes, we usually first think of the 70s, but the 70s were kind of referencing actually the, the platform shoes of the 1940s and then kind of taking them to a new level. So these are um, black uh, peep toe heels. So there's this little cut in the front, so the toe sticks out. I um, would call them sandals. So I, before knowing much about shoes, I would have always thought sandals are <laughs> flats and things you wear at the beach, but Sandals are really shoes that where a lot of the shoe, the, the foot is exposed. And so especially heels that have just kind of straps at the back are often referred to as sandals. So these are kind of evening sandals, high heel sandals, but they would still be referred to as sandals. And it may be tough to see depending on um, what kind of screen adjustments you have of this because it's black on black embellishment. I do have a slide coming up that is corrected in a way where you'll be able to see the embellishments a lot better. So if it's tough to see in this picture, don't worry. But these shoes have these little black chevrons decorating the top of the, the toe box and around the platform and then down the back of the heel. And then at the top of, on the front of the shoe and then at the back of the shoe, there's this little circle of this um, black and gold and patterned fabric with a little bit of color in it. So these are just really cool. These, these are also made in Pennsylvania. So these just like all over decorated shoes. Um, our record says that refers to the decoration as beading. I, they, I, I think of beading as something you have to stitch down. I don't know how these are applied to the shoes other than being glued. Again, I sort of often think of, you know, like a decoration glued on being kind of a cheap process. None of this has appeared to fall off. It's so it's very high quality glued on if that is the case. Um, just a fun, I, I like this photo that we have in the museum collection of these four women who are at a fashion show. I don't know if they were fashion show attendees or if they were models for a fashion show, but they have some really cool kind of late 40s, early 50s shoes, particularly this woman second from the right, which has these black platform sandals, kind of similar in shape to these. And it looks sort of metallic. There's some kind of decoration around that platform. And so I really like both these pairs of shoes of using using that platform space as additional real estate to put decoration on. So here, this is that overcorrected version of this image. Um, so you can really see the decoration of this. Um, so these, these, all these little tiny pieces, I, I believe that they are plastic, um, but again, like plastic glued to a shoe sounds like a recipe for a really cheap looking shoe, but these are just so beautifully done. Um, a, a shoe store in Seattle that I don't know much about, Pessimers, uh, which was, was downtown. I don't think it lasted very long, but they certainly sh sold a fabulous pair of shoes. These are another uh, fantastic gold, gold sandals. Uh, so they have a, they're gold just at the front of the shoe and then there's just a strap in the back also with a little peep toe in the front. And the main fabric of this looks kind of scaly. It has this kind of cool scaly effect to it. And when you zoom in on it, I think that it is some kind of mesh overlay because then there is this gold cording that is woven through it to kind of all join together and center at the top center of the shoe with this little gold colored um, metal band with, with rhinestones on it. And it kind of looks like a butterfly. All of these um, lines of the gold coming together to kind of meet in the middle. It looks like a, a butterfly that's kind of spreading its wings on the front of the shoe. This is from another, um, this was Ger Gerald's, which was a downtown, I think um, for some reason, 505 Fifth Avenue sticks in my head. So I believe that was the address. Again, not a very long lived uh, store. These are these are from the late 40s or early 50s. So this is that kind of thicker, straighter heel is more 40s than um, farther into the 50s, you got uh, that narrower, that narrow heel. So this is from the late 40s, early 50s. And then this is the last pair. I had to end with some Cinderella shoes because these, these are like the most Cinderella ones we have in the collection. So this is another pair of heeled sandals. The front is a clear plastic. It's got a um, opening in the front for the toes. And then the plastic has uh, 
rhinestones on it. I don't know what kind of plastic it is. It's definitely held up pretty well from being from the 1940s. I always think that um, shoes that have the, that are like see-through always look better like this than with a foot in them. Maybe like, I feel like my toes would be all squished together and it wouldn't be very pretty, but then the back of this heel. So it's got this tall silver heel with lines of rhinestones going down, lines going down, but then also these kind of looped swags. There's something so elegant about the, the rhinestones on the back. It's just beautiful. These were, these are late forties shoes. They were worn by a woman named Faye Settles Olson. And she was a window dresser at the Bon Marche. And the Bon Marche, another beloved Seattle department store, it was renamed Macy's. And then um, I think there are still some local Macy's but the big downtown Macy's, which was the flagship Bon Marche store did close earlier last year. And so she would have done um, the windows, the downtown windows, which was not just mannequin dressing, but you know the whole decorations and background and that she was a, an artist by trade. So making kind of cool things and she donated some really fabulous shoes to the collection. So she had a, she had a good eye. All right, so I'm gonna take questions first about these particular three pairs of shoes, um, but then um, open it up if there's still kind of general shoe questions. Well, you have the right crowd in the audience tonight um, because we did find out more about the violet shoes are oh. actually, uh, there are a reference to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but also named after Rachel Sprague's, Sprague, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right, daughter. Uh, oh, yes, I forgot violet. that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for sharing that, Rachel. That's really sweet. Um, we do have some questions about these gorgeous heels. What it's really thinking about today. Do you think high heels are less fashionable these days? Less fashionable. I mean, it that that's a big question. I think yes. it depends on who you ask. I mean, if you if you subscribe to Vogue, they're still showing pictures of heels, and it's you know it's the pandemic. Like nobody's who's walking around in heels. Um, I think it I think it depends on the city and the context. I think Seattle is not so much of a high heeled town. I don't see a lot of people walking around, um, well, don't see a lot of people these days at all. But uh, back, you know, back before the pandemic, being downtown, um, I don't, towering heels, tall heels, I think that's not as common. When I lived in New York, I had classmates that wore tall heels every single day to class. And it seemed, seemed like a hassle to me, but that they loved them. They, they couldn't live without their high heels. So I, I mean, I think in general, there is a question about how the pandemic is going to affect fashion because we've all been wearing much more comfortable clothes if we've, if we've been fortunate enough to work from home. Um, and that there's a question is after the pandemic, are we gonna wanna stick with them? Or are we gonna be so sick of that? You know, I think someone at the beginning said, oh, they're my, my heels miss me or my, you know, that like, they can't wait to wear their fancy heels again and come, come up with a reason to dress up. I feel like I go back and forth. There's days that I'm like ready to just wear sweaters all the time. And then days when I really just want to dress up and I want to put my heels on and just make it work. You are not alone in that, Clara. <laughs> <laughs> now here's a question that is a classic. I know you've heard similar ones to this before many times. Is there something you or others would call a Seattle shoe? Ooh, uh, I do think that we, well, I, I, you've seen some, all of these shoes were purchased or worn in Seattle. So all of these shoes by definition are Seattle shoes. So I think that there are always people in Seattle who love fancy dressy shoes. I think Seattle in general has a more, more casual tendency so that, that I think a lot of flatter or more practical shoes tend to be more popular here um, than they might be in other cities. Uh, but I feel like after doing this, the, the Seattle style exhibit, um, I guess, yeah, now it was two years ago because of 2021, um, is that there are trends in Seattle style, but I would never want to call one, you know, there, there's so many different experiences in Seattle. So, you know, these are, these shoes on the screen are Seattle shoes, even though you know, a lot of Seattle women have never worn a shoe like this. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> like kind of a political answer of like, you're not gonna, 
<laughs> Everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is our last chance uh, for questions. So if you have any final questions, please let us know. And while you're getting those in, uh, I will let you know we would love to hear your feedback tonight. So we're going to be dropping a survey link in the chat box and you can tell us how this program worked for you and, and what other programs you might want to see. I also want to plug our uh, photo package that we are offering. This is something we tried last time we did a behind the scenes program as just kind of like a, a digital postcard book of this program. Uh, it's a way to support Mohai. It's a way to um, have copies of these for yourself. They're for personal use. They can make Zoom backgrounds or print them out and put them in a scrapbook. I don't know. Uh, these, so this is, I, I hope I picked, these are the ones that I thought people would gravitate towards as kind of the top eight from the program. Uh, but there's information that you'll get from the follow-up email. And I think was in the email that you got uh, this afternoon uh, about how to purchase this package if you're interested. And we should mention that Mohai members do get a $5 discount on this package. So be sure you're logged into your Mohai membership account or become a member. Well, I think, Clara, it's time for us to call this evening a night. And my goodness, what a pleasant way to spend the hour. <laughs> These are such wonderful, delightful shoes to look at. And I always learn so much from you and all the people who attend. So thank you, Clara. Thank you for sharing these. Mm -hmm. and. Thank you also to all of our audience who showed up tonight. We have another program coming up soon. Um, we have actually, we're continuing with our regular program schedule. So please visit mohai.org to find out uh, what our next programs are gonna be. The next one coming next week, actually, uh, January 20th, 6.30 p.m. It's free, our History Cafe monthly program, and this time featuring Dr. Dowdy Abe and his recent published book, Emerald City Hip Hop. It's going to be a great program, lots to learn. Uh, so you can register that for that one on our website. And then we also, if you have just found out about Mohai, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. I know many of you, um, I recognize your names. It's so happy to see that you're still logging on and joining us, even though we definitely miss you in person. We really appreciate all of your support. So if you've learned anything new tonight or you enjoy the work that we're doing, please consider making a gift uh, to support Mohai through this incredibly unprecedented <laughs> and temporary closure. We really appreciate your support. When you leave Zoom, you'll actually see a pop-up on our website. It'll show you exactly where you can make a donation or just learn more about all the things we do here. And on that note, we'll let you all get back to your slippers or maybe your fabulous shoes. <laughs> and we hope to see you again. Stay safe, everybody. Good night. <laughs>